thank you guys. And um, yeah, it's my privilege to come and uh, speak now uh, in the after lunch session, which is always the hardest one, particularly if like me, you're from the Mediterranean when all you want is have a little siesta. Um, it's been really great holding up this kind of value of reaching the unreached over the last couple of days, like a precious gem. Lots of different perspectives, lots of different um, angles and, and seeing different things in this value that we believe is both biblical and uh, prophetic imperative. And um, what I want to do in this session really is look at the biblical imperative of um, reaching the unreached and not take for granted that we think that's what Christians should be doing. Um, but as well as looking uh, at scripture robustly, also to consider this as a prophetic imperative. In fact, we were in Cyprus a few weeks ago with a team uh, doing what um, Susie was telling us really that we should try and do, which was we took a team to Cyprus, uh, to the south and to the north, just to learn, to meet people, to hear what God's doing. So not to try and, you know, build anything or do anything, but just to learn and, and explore. And it was while we were there, I felt God speak to me and say, um, you know, speak on arise and go in the scripture. And um, you, you see it in the Jonah story where God says to Jonah, arise and go. And Jonah has a whole load of um, challenges to overcome. But as I looked at it, um, I realized that, that there is this phrase that is in the Lord's mouth um, in the middle of Acts. And we see this phrase repeatedly. So in fact, we're going to see it in Acts chapter eight. God says to Philip, arise and go. And Philip has to overcome uncertainty. Then in Acts chapter nine, God says to Ananias, arise and go. And Ananias has to overcome fear. And then in Acts chapter 10, God says to Peter, arise and go, as Fusti shared with us last night. And Peter has to overcome prejudice. And so we see this, this imperative from the Lord coming to these different people in different contexts. But the, the imperative is consistent and it is arise and go. So if you've come here this weekend going, God, please speak to me. What are you saying? Here it is. OK, arise and go. But not yet, because I'm still talking. So maybe afterwards. Um, all three of these characters. Uh, so Philip in, Act, in Acts 8, Ananias in Acts 9 and Peter in Acts 10 are involved in cross-cultural mission to someone unreached. Philip's obedience results in the gospel going to an African. Ananias's obedience results in the gospel going to an Asian and Peter's obedience results in the gospel going to a European and so three different men God speaks to them in three different ways they each have their own internal obstacles to overcome uncertainty fear or prejudice but they each end up contributing to the evangelization of an unreached continent and all of them hear a consistent word from God, which is arise and go. So just in context, in terms of the book of Acts, Acts is framed with what Jesus says to the disciples right at the beginning, which is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts is the unpacking of that. It starts in Jerusalem. Then we get to Judea and Samaria, and then we get to the ends of the earth. And for the first seven chapters of Acts, so just before our stories happen, we've been stuck in Jerusalem. Jesus has said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. But for the first seven chapters, the disciples can't get out of Jerusalem. So they're in Jerusalem. They're reaching their Jerusalem. But it actually takes an intervention from God to bring them into the next season of ministry where they can focus on going to the unreached and um so often actually we can get stuck in our jerusalems not for bad reasons but because there's so much to do you know you're never gonna finish reaching your jerusalem before we can arise and go um but in the timings of god there are seasons to lift our eyes and to be moved uh beyond our jerusalems to judea samaria and the ends of the earth and so the trigger happens at the beginning of acts chapter 8 in acts chapter 8 and verse 1 we read, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, 
and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Now, those who were scattered, verse four, went about preaching the word. So God's like, I need to get you guys out of Jerusalem to the unreached. And so this moment happens when everyone's scattered and everyone, wherever they go, is preaching. And then as an example of that, we have these three stories in eight, nine and ten of Acts. I don't think we're supposed to see these stories as exceptional. OK, they're pretty amazing. There's some pretty cool stuff. But I, I think that in context, all the disciples are being scattered. Everyone's getting on with what God's called them to do. So I think we're supposed to see these stories in this moment as normative because God's doing it with Philip. He's doing it with Ananias. He's doing it with Peter. He's also doing it with some unnamed disciples in chapter 11, men from Cyprus, obviously the best kind of men who go to uh, Antioch. And so I believe that in this context of mission momentum, we're supposed to see these three stories as normative for us because otherwise uh, how is it instructive for us if they're just exceptional miracle working stories then how does that teach us anything and yet all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking instructing training people and so at all times god is calling his people to arise and go but in our context as fusi uh, kind of shared this prophetic note last night this next 10 or 15 years are going to be uh, an, an opportunity for us either to really arise and go and get some proper stuff done or they're going to be a missed opportunity and we're going to look back and go there was a real chance there and we didn't take it and so we're going to look uh, this afternoon at these three stories just briefly um, and then we're just going to compare the three and the question really for you is, which of these three stories really resonates with you in your situation? So the question isn't, is God saying arise and go? Because he is in all three. The question is, in what way and in what context do you need to arise and go where you are? So that's what we're going to do. OK, so story number one. Here we go. Uh, Acts chapter eight and verse 26. And this is Philip reaching the Ethiopian eunuch now an angel of the lord said to philip 8 and 26 arise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from jerusalem to gaza this is a desert place and he rose and went and there was an ethiopian a eunuch a court official of candace queen of the ethiopians who was in charge of all her treasure he had come to jerusalem to worship and he was returning seated in his chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah and the spirit said to Philip go over and join this chariot so Philip's just been powerfully used by God in Samaria like miracles demons coming out basically all the stuff that Jeremiah was just telling us about um they see this witch doctor come to faith uh, incredible moment big crowds powerful preaching and yet God takes him out of there and says, arise and go to the desert road towards the south. And so he comes out of the busy, popular ministry. And it's God's prerogative to take him out of that and say, I'm putting you in the desert on your own, home of the prophets, home of kind of lonely men of God. And um, God speaks to him through an angel. So just hold that. The way God speaks to Philip is through an angel. There's no plan. There's no strategy. It's a very minimalist calling. Arise and go towards the south. That's it. What am I going to do? I don't know. How long am I going to be there? I don't know. What are you expecting me to contribute? I don't know. How am I going to measure my success? I don't know. And um, the desert is always a place of uncertainty. It's always a kind of wild place in the Bible. It's the kind of prophetic place, like people like John the Baptist with crazy hair, that kind of place. And I would have had a million questions, right? What's, what's the plan? What would we need to do? And as his pastor, if Philip had come to me and said, God told me to go towards the south to the desert. OK, what are you going to do? I don't know. You know, as his pastor sending him, I would have struggled because we want to send people well and support them well. How much money do we need to raise for Philip? I don't know. How do we support him? I don't know. When are we going to go visit him? I don't... And so. And seriously, as sending churches, we need to learn how to release people like Philip who are going on not a lot of information 
And because that is one of the ways, it's not the only way, but it is one of the ways that God calls people, as we see here. So God calls him to a direction, not to a destination. He says, go towards the south. And um, I think this is important. Sometimes God calls people towards a direction. So he may have called you towards health care. He may have called you towards compassionate ministry or towards young people. Or he may have called you towards the east. And so sometimes God calls people to a direction, not to a destination. Uh, he's given a real sparseness of detail. But in context, in the next verse, God, uh, God says to him, arise and go. And in the next verse, Philip arose and went. I love it. Just really obedient, really simple. And um, it's interesting. Sharon and Lex have been hosting this conference for us from Iraq. And I think their story is a bit like this. I think they felt that they should go to Iraq and the people that were involved in their sending eight years ago were kind of going, um, what are you going to do there? And they're like, we don't really know. You know, How long are you going to be there? We don't know. Are you aware that ISIS are in Iraq at the moment? Yeah, we we're aware of that. You know, so they've kind of got this word from God, this direction, but not a lot of detail. And I think we've got to get better at supporting and releasing Phillips uh, because Otherwise, we're not going to reach Ethiopian eunuchs because you need Phillips to reach Ethiopian eunuchs. And um, in the history of mission, there's always been a place for the Phillips who hear a rise and go. But also there is, and Fusi referred to this yesterday, there's a kind of anti-colonial tone to it as well, because colonial mission, colonialism linked mission was often about having a plan, having resources, coming in with big structure. Um, and saying we're going to turn up and we're going to do this and you know it's a little like Susie was saying in terms of white saviorism and there's something that the Lord I believe is unpicking in that at the moment in terms of particularly mission from the west to the majority world it, we, we're not throwing out the baby with the bath wall we're not saying that shouldn't happen anymore because we uh, we don't want to bring those kind of old colonial influences and expectations but i think one of the things that god is stripping is some of that plan some of that high resource and actually some of this philip call of arise and go and see what god will do trust me depend on me uh, dave nunn who is with us at this conference uh, he tells a story of a, an 18 year old young woman in his church who kept saying i feel called to china i feel called to china and she interviewed for lots of mission agencies and none of them passed her because all she was saying is, I feel called to China. They were like, what are you going to do? I don't know. <laughs> How are you going to live there? I don't know. I just feel called. And so in the end, Dave said to her, well, you feel called to China. And as your pastor, uh, we agree that you, you, you're called to China. So why don't you just buy a ticket? And she went and she was actually there for years and years and incredibly fruitful. And so there will be Phillips who don't fit our boxes, who don't have a plan. But that is one of the ways that God calls people. Not the only way, but one of the ways. Um, and then there's this Ethiopian. So um, he works for the Candice. Now, the Candice was a hereditary position in the Ethiopian court, like the Queen Mother. Uh, she's a powerful woman as part of the Ethiopian setup. And um, he's her treasurer. And he's been to Jerusalem to worship. It's a long way by chariot from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. So this is commitment, right? He's been all the way there to worship, and now he's on his way home. While he was there, he bought or commissioned a very expensive scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, most people didn't own scripture. It would have cost him a lot of money to get one of these copied out by a scribe. His visit to Jerusalem would have been disappointing for him for two reasons. So all that way, all that money, all that effort. Firstly, because he's a foreigner, because he's not Jewish, because he's African, he can't enter the temple. So he could offer sacrifice, but from outside by proxy. So it's gone all the way there, but he can't enter the temple. And secondly, he's a eunuch. And according to Deuteronomy 23, anyone with um, this kind of physical disability can't enter the presence of God. And so the problem is within himself, within his own flesh, his ethnicity and his disability. And they're things that he can't change about himself. And so He's being excluded by the Jerusalem system, by the established religion. It's so sad. He's made all this effort. And yet when he gets there, the system excludes him and says, you're not welcome because of your ethnicity, because of your disability. And so he's returning home. He's disappointed. 
He's in his chariot reading. I get quite travel sick when I try and read in a car, but he's in his chariot reading his scroll of Isaiah. And, um, and he reads about someone who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And then we read in verse 33, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his descendants? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? And so he's reading, he's reading out loud, and Philip, the Holy Spirit, has told him to run alongside the chariot. So Philip's running in the desert, in the hot, alongside this chariot. He hears the guy reading the scripture, and um, he reads about someone who, in humiliation, justice was dis- denied him, and who can describe his descendants. So he reads about someone who's lived with shame and who can't have any children and dies without having any children. And this is the Philip's, this is the eunuch's great existential fear. You know, I can't have any children. I live in humiliation and shame. And so he sees here someone who resonates with him and he says, who is this writing about? Is it about the prophet or about someone else? And Philip's able to explain to him and say, um, well, no, Isaiah had a wife and kids. It wasn't about him. This is about someone else. This is about someone who identifies with your humiliation and with your exact issue. They're dying childless. This is about Jesus. And so from there, he's able to explain who Jesus is. And um, Philip had asked him, what, you know, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy had said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And so he invited Philip up into the chariot. And again, this is a lovely picture of cross-cultural witness you know Philip you're running hard to keep up with the chariot to get alongside him I often think that's like trying to learn a language uh, trying to settle in a culture you know you're running hard just to get to where people are to kind of get at the same speed as them but then actually it's by invitation not by imposition Philip doesn't just start preaching at him the guy says I've got a question I need someone to guide me and he invites Philip into his chariot and there Philip's able to share with him about Jesus. And then they see some water and the guy gets baptized and then supernaturally Philip is whisked out of there and he disappears and that's his exit strategy. And um, the early church fathers, uh, even as early as Irenaeus said that this Ethiopian went back to his country, shared the gospel in his circle of influence. And this was the beginning of an Ethiopian Christianity an African Christianity that continued for 2000 years and Ethiopia is still Christian today. And so it's one of the most consistent uh, Christian nation states in history. And so like Christ, this guy had no physical descendants. He couldn't have kids, but he had millions of spiritual descendants. And so he, he's just one person who gets encountered in a desert, but through him, we actually see a nation and even a continent encounter Jesus. That's the first story, okay? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Story number two, the story of Ananias. Now, we love Ananias because he's only got a few verses in the Bible. He's your your classic example of humble mission. He pops into the story. He does his thing. He pops out of the story. But because of his contribution, Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, is able to launch the Asian church, launch the Gentile mission, and have an incredible impact on the history of Christianity, including writing most of the New Testament. And all of that is on this moment of obedience from Ananias. Okay, here we go. Ananias chapter 9 and verse 10. Uh, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision. So now God speaks to him. He has a vision of the Lord Jesus. The Lord said to him, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But but Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And if I go there and tell him I've come in your name, he'll probably bind me 
I don't want to be binded. Um, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he's got to suffer for my name. So Ananias departed and he entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said to him, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's the story. This time, the Lord speaks to Ananias in a vision of the Lord Jesus. And he says, here I am. And then he gives him a very specific set of instructions. So an address, a name of a person, and he tells him exactly what physically he has to do. You've got to lay your hands on him. Really simple. I, I would love that calling. Really easy. Right. I've got to go to this address, find this person, lay my hands on him. I'll know if I've achieved it or not. Right. I can measure. Now, God still speaks to people that way today. Sometimes it's a wonderful thing. Here's a story um, from uh, an Islamic North African country from a friend of ours. This is his testimony. Um, he was a Muslim man ex experiencing financial difficulties. His crops weren't growing and he can't find any other work. So he visits the imam in his village mosque and says, this is happening. What do I do? And his imam says to him, brother, fast and pray for three days and the Lord will show you what to do. So he fasts and prays for three days. And on the third night, he has a dream. And in his dream, he is told, he hears a voice say to him, travel across the mountains to the big city and ask for a specific house number on a specific road and knock on the door. And when you go in, ask there for a person called Isa, which in Arabic is Jesus, because he is the answer. And he wakes up. So he packs his bag and he says to his family, I'll be back soon. And he heads off and he travels over the mountains all day and he arrives in the city when it's getting dark and he doesn't know the city. So he's asking around. He hasn't got Google Maps or anything. He's asking around. Where is this street? Gets directed to the street, goes to the house number that he saw in his dream, knocks on the door. Guy opens the door like this. Who are you? And he says, I've been sent here by my dream to ask you about Isa because he's the problem. He's the answer to all my problems. So the guy says, come in, come in. And it's a secret believer. And he's able to introduce him to Jesus and lead him to the Lord. And that's that's a story from a friend of ours. And so Ananias has this specific word from God. And um, what was what is his objection? He says, yeah, but Lord, I'm not, uh, 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 you know, um, and his objection is this guy, Saul, is binding Christians and killing people and putting them in prison. He's, and, and so it's a specific fear based on evidence that this is a scary thing to do. And he's like, Lord, I don't want I, would, I don't want to do this. It's scary. And um, it's not a general anxiety about uncertainty. It's a specific fear about a particularly scary thing. And it's a little bit like the story that Jeremiah told us earlier when he ends up in a city that is known to be full of people from a well-known um, uh, Islamic dangerous group. And he's like, but Lord, I know these kind of people. Do you really want me to go there and say that I'm a Christian? You know, but the Lord is like, no, this is what I'm asking you to do. And, and so he goes, he does it, he prays for him. And then he disappears from the story. Um, he's not whisked away. He just stops being in the verses. And, and the story isn't about Ananias. And what we realize is we thought this was Ananias's story and Saul is one of his converts. But actually, it's Saul's story and Ananias is one of his influences. And, you know, so often that's one of the mind shifts that happens in cross-cultural mission. We think, oh, this is my story and these people are my converts. And what you find out is, no, 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 no. It's their story. And we were just one of their little catalysts, one of their little fire lighting sparks. And um, there were too many books about the white missionaries who went to other places and too few books about actually the people that were impacted by their mission and what happened as a result. And um, just as through Philip, the gospel came to an African who went and impacted Africa. 
now the gospel comes to an Asian Christian because Saul is from Tarsus in Turkey, which is Asia. And, um, and through him, there's going to be an impact into the Asian church, uh, which still lasts today. And churches in some of the places that Saul worked are still there today, like in Tarsus. And so you never know, but behind any individual, there could be a, a people movement, there could be churches that last for generations. And um, numbers don't matter. Yeah, it's not about how many people came to faith through your ministry. With Ananias, as far as we know, this is all he did. He could have retired on this and spent the rest of his life just kind of drinking wine and telling his friends about the time God used him. Um, but his impact is phenomenal and significant. And um, this, this has a particular resonance for those who are joining us from the Unreached UK track, because as Fusi was saying to us, and as Dr. Harvey Kriani said to us last year, there is this unique moment where we have visitors in our cities in the UK and we could impact them and who knows what God will do through them. And um, that's what happens in this story. Saul is a visitor to Damascus. He's there temporarily, but in that time, he encounters Jesus and his whole life has changed. And so um, Paul Mumo Kisau, who is the Associate Professor of uh, theology at Nairobi International School of Theology is a Kenyan theologian. He says this about this story. Ananias is a hero of inclusivity. He models a community where past enemies are able to become friends and call each other brother. And he's an example to those who find it hard to invite their enemies into the Christian community. And so Ananias here is a peacemaker. He's a broker and he welcomes saw a previous enemy into the family of God. And now we come to our third and final story. So we've seen Acts 8 and Acts 9, now we're going to be in Acts 10. And Fusi taught us this story yesterday, which I didn't know he was going to do. So that means I can just ping through it a little bit quicker. Um, but this is Peter reaching Cornelius. And let's pick the story up in verse 19 of chapter 10. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, so the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter, behold, three men are looking for you. Arise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and he said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests and the next day he rose and went with them and with some of the brothers from Joppa accompanying him and on the following day they entered Caesarea Cornelius was expecting them and he called together his relatives and his close friends so God is going to send Peter to share the gospel with Roman soldiers Peter hates Roman soldiers all good Jews of his generation hated Roman soldiers they were the evil oppressor Everything that they had from Rome was bad. The people were hungry, but the Roman soldiers were well fed. The people were trying to stay away from idolatry, but the Roman soldiers were planting temples and idols, particularly in Caesarea. Uh, Peter's heritage from his family, from his parents, would have been stories of his people being tortured, raped, killed, pillaged by Imperial Rome. And Peter's closest friend, the Lord Jesus, was put to death coldly, callously professionally by roman soldiers peter hates roman soldiers as his heritage from his parents he's got a deep prejudice i grew up in um the greek side of cyprus and we were taught to hate turks everything you know when we played games it was like let's play kill the turks you're going to be the turk let's all kill you you know and everything was just a hatred of Turks because of the 1974 invasion. Um, but after I came to faith, the Lord called me to go to Turks and to go to live in Istanbul. And all my Greek friends were like, what are you doing? We hate Turks. And this is like this moment here for Peter, a deeply ingrained revulsion. And so the Lord has to work on Peter's heart. And he does this through this vision of the sheep coming down from heaven that Fusi told us about. And um, the story happens in Joppa, and Joppa is where the Jonah story took place. So when, 
when Jonah runs away from the call of God to arise and go to Nineveh, the evil oppressors, he runs away from Joppa. And so here it triggers in our memory uh, the Jonah story. And um, the Lord shows him the sheet and says, arise and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 you can't catch me out. I know you're testing me. Of course, I'm not going to eat anything unclean. Of course, I wouldn't go to Romans. And, um, and as he's thinking about this and reflecting on it um, in his heart, then the doorbell rings um, and it's these Roman soldiers come to ask him to come with them. And um, you can't break new ground externally unless you're breaking new ground internally. And you can't reach the unreached corners of the globe unless you're allowing God to reach the unreached corners of your own heart. And this story, it's about Cornelius's conversion, but it's also about Peter's conversion. Um, from his prejudice, God's working in Peter so that he can work through Peter. And at the same time, God's working in Cornelius so that he can work through Cornelius. And so the Holy Spirit says to him, arise and go down without hesitation. And there's this shock factor that happens here. It's like, I've just seen this sheet. I'm thinking about it. And then these guys have knocked at the door and, and God's kind of throwing him a one, two, uh, so that his kind of muscle memory of revulsion doesn't have time to kick in. He doesn't have time to process how theologically wrong this is or how culturally difficult it is, or what he'll tell his mother about it. He just gets caught up in the moment and has to go along, and that's how the Holy Spirit leads him. And so for Peter, the call is, arise and go and accompany these men. So his call isn't to a particular address or to a direction. It's actually to these people. His call is to arise and go with these men and go wherever that go go wherever they go. And sometimes that's how God calls people is to be with people. So God calls people to accompany other people. And sometimes that's the nature of the calling that God gives to us. So he invites them into the Jewish home where he's staying. So there is this hospitality, uh, but it's on his own terms because it's in a Jewish house. He can serve them. Um, I was going to say halal food, kosher food. He's got control of the environment. So when you're the host, um, you still have a bit of control of the environment and you can still do that and otherwise the people that you're serving without having to deal with your prejudice. But then when he has to go with them and go and be their guest in Caesarea, then the tables are turned and now he's completely out of his comfort zone and he walks into Caesarea and looks around and everywhere there's Roman soldiers that gives him the heebie-jeebies and everywhere there's temples with idols and the footprint of imperial Rome oppressing his people. And, um, and it, it's an overwhelming experience for him. And he walks into the house to meet this guy, Cornelius, but Cornelius has invited his whole family and all his friends. And so Peter's there in a room full of Roman soldiers. They're probably putting their weapons down by the door. But as he starts to speak, the Lord comes, the Holy Spirit falls on them. They begin speaking in tongues. And so you don't expect a Roman soldier to see an angel. You don't expect Romans who haven't even got saved yet to get baptized in the spirit and start speaking in tongues. And the Roman soldier doesn't expect an illiterate, uneducated, backward fisherman to come and tell him about God. And so everybody's minds are being blown and God loves doing that. And so this experience, it changes the Romans, but it also changes Peter. And he stays with them a few days, they're baptized, and then he leaves. So those are three stories, right? Now, what I'm going to do just by way of ending is I'm just going to share my screen. And I want us to uh, just compare and contrast these three narratives from the book of Acts. And as we do this, we are thinking about the question. Can you just enable my screen sharing, please? And as we do this, we are just thinking about the question. There you go. Can you see that? Uh, we are thinking about the question, what is the Lord saying to you? Which one of these stories resonates with you? And the answer for all of us will be the Lord is saying, arise and go. But it could look different for different ones of us. And so Philip is called in the scripture an evangelist. Ananias is called a disciple and Peter is called an apostle. And so it doesn't matter what people call you, arise and go. Sometimes we get caught up on what people call us. Actually, just arise and go. OK. Philip is spoken to by an angel. Ananias is spoken to by the Lord in a vision. And Peter is spoken to by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter how God speaks to you. Arise and go. Don't get caught up in. I haven't seen an angel or I haven't had a vision. 
the Lord speaks to different people in different ways. But the message in this moment of missional momentum is consistent. Arise and go. Philip is used to reach an African. Ananias is used to reach an Asian. And Peter is used to reach a European. You know, later there's a church in Rome. And Paul writes to it and goes and visits it. And we don't know who started the church in Rome. But I think it could well have been these guys because they were the Italian regiment who were based for a season in Palestine. I think they came to faith and then went back to Italy. And they could be the guys that started the church in Rome. And so who did they reach? They reached different people, but they were all from unreached places. Philip is called in a direction. So to what go towards the south. Ananias is given a specific name, a specific address, a specific path. We'd all love that one. Um, and Peter is called to certain people and he's told to accompany them. And so there are different kinds of callings. And so, again, don't get stuck in your head about, oh, I haven't been given this particular kind of calling. And the challenge for sending pastors and sending churches is to help people in discerning their calling, but also going, how do, I, how do we support a Philip? How do we support an Ananias or a Peter? And so that's part of processing people's callings. Philip, the context of his mission is in the desert. For Ananias, it's a guest to his city. And to Peter, he has to go to an enemy city. And so, again, the context of mission can be different. Cities aren't more important than desert places. And uh, Philip is, uh, they all go on a journey in some way. So Philip's journey is to the desert. Ananias's journey is across his city to another street. And Peter's journey is up the coast from Joppa to Caesarea. But in all of them, there's a physical journey, but there is also an experiential, a spiritual, an existential journey. There's a journey that they're going through in their own hearts as they learn to overcome certain challenges. And so with all of us in cross-cultural mission, there is a journey that happens. For Philip, he has to overcome uncertainty. For Ananias, he has to overcome fear. And for Peter, he has to overcome prejudice. So we've all got something that we've got to overcome when God calls us, that could stop us, that could block us. And we're all changed in the going. Hallelujah. In terms of all three get to sharing Jesus. Now, this is really important because we talk a lot about contextualization. But the reality is whether people are from Africa, Asia or Europe, we have to get to Jesus. Right. And we have to get to baptism. But they get to Jesus in different ways. So with the eunuch, he's got a deeply personal question about humiliation, shame and dying without children. And that is answered through Jesus in the scripture and having it explained to him. Ananias, uh, Saul has had an experience of Jesus. He gets knocked off his horse. He gets blinded. And Ananias is able to explain that to him, but also affirm his inclusion by calling him brother. And Peter, when he stands up to preach, he starts with his own recent experience of Jesus very humbly. He stands up and he says, I, I've just realized that God accepts everyone that shows no partiality, even you guys. And so all three get to sharing Jesus, but in different ways. All three are baptized. And this highlights, I think, in these stories, the importance of baptism in the discipleship journey. All three have had a, a preparation in their hearts. They've all had their own journey or encounter with God. Now, this is really important because... A lot of the stories that we hear coming from unreached peoples are about people seeing a dream or a vision or having a supernatural encounter. And sometimes we can think that that negates the need for us to arise and go. Yet in all three stories, not only have these people had their own encounter, they also need someone sent to them to explain, to affirm, to connect with them. And so the, the eunuch's been to Jerusalem. He's bought an expensive scroll, but he says, I can't understand it without a guide. With Saul, he heard a light, he heard a voice, he saw a light, he fell off his horse, but he needs Ananias to come and call him brother. And with Cornelius, he saw an angel while he was praying, but the angel told him, you need Peter to come and explain this to you. And so there will always be a need for cross-cultural mission 
communicators who will make themselves available to answer the needs of people, even if they're on their own journey. And then with all of them, in all three stories, there's an exit, there's a redeployment, there's a dismantling of the scaffolding and a recrafting it somewhere else. And so Philip has a supernatural deployment. And sometimes that happens. People don't have a plan to leave, but then they have to leave. We've got friends on this call who were serving in certain countries who got thrown out and they hadn't planned to. But leaving is part of the journey. Ananias just disappears from the story and you just realize it wasn't his story. It was somebody else's story. And Peter stays for a few days, plants a house church, lays a bit of a foundation and then leaves. So those are the three stories I wanted us to look at. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into some breakout rooms and have 10 minutes or so to discuss, to reflect. And really the question in all of it isn't, is God saying to you arise and go? Because that's consistent through all of these, but it is in what way and in what sense is God saying to you, arise and go.